As you can see from the previous lesson, there are many opportunities for innovation in organisations and many ways for people in those organisations to innovate. So how come there were so many innovation options and opportunities? Many people and organisations find being innovative so challenging. I'm often asked to help the leadership teams in large organisations make their organisations more innovative. This is because while they recognise the need to innovate uh, in order to either defend against more innovative competitors or to take advantage of new opportunities, they struggle to both create the innovation imperative within their organisation and to change the way their people behave. This then is the innovation challenge, which John Bassant explains in more detail. I guess the big challenge is where is the process? How does it work? Could it work more effectively? So the process is a kind of a framework that helps us. It's, it's a map, if you like, for this journey from ideas to value. And that's its, uh, it, its strength inside an organisation as well, because it becomes the focal point for organising a number of activities. If you've got a startup, much of this can go on fairly informally. If you've got 35,000 people, you probably need to put some kind of formal process, some formal structure, understand who's contributing at which stage, it becomes a focusing um, core device, a bit like a skeleton in a body, it gives it some shape. Acknowledging the challenges of innovation is the first step in helping to understand why innovation is so difficult, both for individuals and for companies. So let me start by explaining this. Current procedures are designed around the assumption that business tomorrow is the same as today. But in the world of innovation, that is the opposite of what we assume. Rules and procedures developed to manage one type of organizational risk can have the unintended consequence of stifling innovation. Let's start by acknowledging that most people and organizations perceive the need to innovate, but struggle to actually do this. In some cases, the challenge may be that they don't fully realise the innovation imperative. In others, they may be challenged with simply innovating. The challenges of changing behaviours in an organisation in order to become more innovative is known as innovation inertia. Given my background as an engineer, I developed three laws of innovation inertia, loosely based on Newton's three laws of physical inertia drawing the direct parallel between changing an object's movement, inertia, and changing people's behavior in an organization. First, there is a natural tendency for organizations to keep on doing what they're doing and resist changes to what they're doing. In the absence of a force, they'll continue to do what they've always done. Second, Larger organizations require more force to change what they're doing than smaller organizations. And third, for every force, there is a reaction force that is equal in size, but opposite in direction. When someone exerts a force on an organization, he or she gets pushed back in the opposite direction equally hard. In organizations rather than individuals, the innovation challenge is amplified. When making presentations at conferences, I use the tagline, what got you here won't get you there, to describe this challenge. This is because leaders who've often enjoyed successful careers in the organization have done so under the old rules. They are often reluctant to change these rules that have allowed them to thrive or to fully appreciate how these rules can't be applied to a more competitive and innovative environment. In practice, it's dangerous to assume that relying on behaviors that led to previous success will help you achieve future success in a different and more competitive environment. In reporting on a presentation 10 years ago in Mississauga, the media chose to characterize my observation as innovate or die. I couldn't have said it better myself. There's an assumption that innovation is just about developing a new technology, but it can also be about offering a new value proposition, creating a new service or process, 
or developing a new business model. As a consequence, most organizations focus on the new technology, not on changing the way they do business. Growing interest in online sales should have allowed Borders, the US market leader in book retailing, to move to offer their book inventory online. However, rather than seize the opportunity, in 2001, its lack of understanding of how the market was going to change and its risk aversion led it to outsource its online business to Amazon. Not a smart move in retrospect. In fact, Borders was still under the impression that the key to success in book retailing was by opening mega stores and was still doing it in 2009, just two years before it filed for bankruptcy. Borders' unwillingness to take risks and to innovate their business model were the key factors in their failure. Their biggest asset became their biggest liability. It's interesting to look around and see the same pattern currently being repeated in other industries. Improving the innovation process in an organization requires a formal way of capturing, recording, and sharing innovative ideas. A formal and open review process to evaluate which have the highest potential, both for success and to build on the organization's competitive advantages and the receptive to capacity to implement the innovations. Failure to deploy such a process acts as, as a disincentive for people to share their innovations, either because they don't understand why their ideas are not being developed, or because they feel that others are likely to take the credit for their ingenuity. Most organizations allocate resources scarcely, and innovative projects have to compete for resources with traditional improvement projects, where outcomes are more certain. It's difficult to explain why you should choose a $1 million project that has a 30% chance of achieving a 10 times return over a 1 million incremental project that will achieve a 20% return each year guaranteed. Consistent innovation in an organization requires access to dedicated resources and implementation capacity can allocate these resources rapidly on an experimental basis with different expectations for return than those in incremental projects. A commonly cited example of good allocation of innovation resources is Google's 20% time, where employees are allowed to spend 20% of their working time on their own projects. This space in their time led to the development of Google News, Gmail, and even AdSense. Most companies, especially ones employing lean methodologies or Six Sigma, will attempt to drive waste out of the system and in the process, unintentionally stifle innovation. Most organizations have a limited view of where innovation occurs, and they're designed to review opportunities from a limited number of sources, for example, from the lab or from market research. In practice, innovation can arise in a multiple of locations inside and outside the company, from a service technician to a customer service representative, from a valued supplier to an irate customer. However, organizations are not designed for cross-functional activities, and often introduce controls on what can be shared outside the organization, stifling innovation potential. In fact, lack of industry experience and a large investment in the status quo can lead to the observation that truly innovative ideas often come from those outside the industry. Who would have believed a few years ago that the taxi industry was going to be disrupted until Garrett Camp and Travis Kalanick came up with the idea for Uber? an efficient intermediary between passengers and taxi drivers that uses a technology platform to eliminate many of the industry's inefficiencies. Many organizations view their existing strengths as a key competitive advantage and look to leverage them to innovate. This is only natural as it leverages their existing expertise in research, physical infrastructure, or market share. However, this means that they make decisions around the market that are based on resource utilization rather than meeting customer needs or anticipating market trends. This can cause them to miss dramatic changes in industry, especially in one that includes a radical new technology. For example, Kodak was the world leader in inexpensive film cameras as well as film production and film processing. When Steve Sasson, who worked at Kodak, invented the digital camera in 1975, Kodak chose to shut down the division because it would challenge their existing business. Specifically, it would reduce demand for film, paper, and photo processing. 
which was at the heart of their business. Despite their global branding in this space, this failure ultimately led them to file for bankruptcy in 2012. Organizations often unintentionally develop a risk-averse culture, for example, punishing failure. But without failure, there's no risk and no innovation. People that are punished for failure often leave the company or choose to work on less risky projects in the future. This can create a company culture that discourages risk and innovation, in part because it discourages people from taking on risky projects, and in part because it discourages people from recognizing failure at an early stage, which would allow them to shut those projects down and also to learn from them. 